Hello friends and comrades, and happy Victory Day to you. Normally this would be a day to celebrate the triumph of the Allies over Nazi Germany, and a day of pomp and circumstance around the world, with parades all throughout Europe to mark the occasion, as well as a solemn day of remembrance for the 60 million lives or more that were lost to ensure the world's freedom. Sadly, however, war has once again returned to Europe, despite the solemn promises of all that it would never happen again. The worst tragedy of all being that the country which suffered the most has seemingly forgotten why that promise was made, and has turned on a country which, until 2014, they called brothers. The nation that suffered with them against history's most evil force, and as this video will show, gifted them with their greatest heroes. The Soviet Union, for all its faults, and believe me, as you well know, there were many, was the sword on which Nazi Germany met its end, and at the forefront of that effort, in the Pripyat marches as partisans, or as the avenging force of the motherland at Stalingrad, the Ukrainian people rose to the challenge, as over four million of their men and women charged headlong into the fire, until one of them, who would end up becoming a firefighter in Kiev, helped raise the flag over the Reichstag, proclaiming the end of the Third Reich. So on this victory day, in celebration of the defeat of evil, I felt that given what's going on in the world, I should commemorate some of the Ukrainians who gave everything to defeat the fascist invaders, as their grandchildren, sadly, now have to do so again. And let's start, as they say, with the most famous one. 300 Nazis are spelled by your gun. Born in the city of Bilasvetska on the 29th of June 1916, Ludmila Belova was not like the other girls. Traditionalism in Eastern Europe was still very high, even factoring in the later Marxist revisions to gender roles initiated under the Soviet Union. And yet, Ludmila did not give a singular damn about anything anybody said. She would later say that she was a complete tomboy. Moving to Kiev at 14, she became the women's athletic champion of her school district and was ferociously competitive. In the heady days of Stalin's militarization and industrialization of the Soviet Union, the USSR government encouraged the populace to contribute, and so from a young age she had an interest in martial activities and decided to join the Volunteer Society for Cooperation with the Armed Forces, a sporting club which allowed young women to participate in military activities of a sporting nature, as well as regular athletics which she already loved. It was here that she discovered that despite being a great track star and a decent footballer, there was one thing she had a knack for more than anything else. And I am sure you can guess what that was. Shooting. She was a crack shot and was awarded the title of Certified Marksman, along with the Voroshilov Sharpshooter Badge. However, it's the 1930s, and she is, well, a she. And so she did what was expected. She married a man named Alexei Pavlichenko, which is how she got her name, and had a son named Rositslav. But the marriage, sadly, quickly fell apart, and so she moved back home to Kiev. Needing a job, she worked at the Kiev Arsenal factory, making artillery for the Red Army. While doing this, she went to night school to improve her academic credentials, until 1937, where she was accepted to Kiev University to study. Her chosen profession? History teacher. A true woman of culture, not that I'm biased. While there, she was of course a valued member of the university track team, and continued her competition shooting which led her to being trained at the Red Army Sniper School as a reservist for six months, just in case her services would be required. As it turned out, of course, they would be. On June 22, 1941, the Nazis invaded the Soviet Union, and given her experience, as well as her, as one can relate, righteous fury that people had invaded her home, she was one of the first people down the recruiting office, where she was immediately told that as a woman she was supposed to be a nurse and that's where she'd be sent. Which she responded with, as they say these days, Idil Nahui. He therefore checked the file and in fact realised that she was a trained marksman, 
and certified at that. And so he went, all right, fair enough, and assigned her as a sniper to the 25th Rifle Division. Due to a weapons shortages, however, she was only issued with a bayonet and some grenades and then thrown into the Siege of Odessa. German and Romanian forces under Army Group South were charging towards Crimea and Kiev in order to secure the resources of Ukraine and guard the southern flank of the advance on Moscow. However, the Ukrainians, as we see today, are not the giving ground type, and of the three fronts being advanced on during Operation Barbarossa, the slowest progress was Army Group South, somewhat due to the efforts of their leader, General Mikhail Karponos hero of the Soviet Union, but I already mentioned him in another video, my first video on Ukraine, so I suggest checking that out. Odessa, on the Black Sea, was encircled as part of this advance, but the coastal army garrisoned in the city decided that surrender was not an option, and thus they also decided to hold it at all costs. For two and a half months, Pavlichenko fought in defense of the city. In her first days at the front, one of her comrades was mortally wounded, and in his dying moments, he handed her his rifle. Immediately grabbing it, she shot the two Germans advancing on their position dead, beginning her score. By the time the coastal army was evacuated in order to defend Crimea, her kill count stood at 187. She would go on to defend Crimea with her comrades, one of whom was her second husband, Alexei Kitsenko, who would sadly be killed several weeks after their official marriage. She eventually, as a result of the fighting, ended up in the Siege of Sevastopol, or Sevastopol, one of the largest battles ever fought during the Second World War. It was a brutal fight, to the extent that the Germans deployed the largest artillery pieces ever fired, Karl Garat siege mortars and railway artillery, designed originally to assault the Maginot Line. During this brutal field-to-field -field and house-to-house -house fight, Pavlichenko was assigned to lead an operational training unit for snipers, where her students scored over a hundred kills in less than two months, while she herself raised her personal score to 257. By May of 1942, she was finally promoted to lieutenant, an officer at last, and had reached 309 kills, including 36 Axis snipers which, when you consider how difficult and strenuous sniper duels are, some of which lasted for days in her case, with limited water and food, that is an incredible achievement. In June, however, she was wounded by mortar fire, and as a hero of the Soviet Union, she was evacuated by submarine. After recuperation, she was appointed to the Soviet sniper school to train the new sniper recruits. However, given that she was a woman and had over 300 confirmed kills, the Soviet propaganda ministry decided she was more useful as being a spokesperson for the Red Army. Better yet, she was educated and was training to be a history teacher, so she had experience in oratory and presentation. And so, she was sent on a publicity tour to the United States, where she was received by President FDR and, more poignantly, the First Lady of the United States, Eleanor Roosevelt. The two women became firm friends and related greatly as both were civil rights activists for the rights of women, so much so that Eleanor Roosevelt would later visit her on her visit to the Soviet Union in 1957. Ludmilla, though, was not taken seriously by the American press initially. After all, how could a woman be so fearsome? That was until she said, and I am quoting directly here, Gentlemen, I am 25 years old, and I have killed 309 fascist invaders by now. Don't you think that you have been hiding behind my back for too long? End quote. After that moment, she received a huge wave of support, raising immense sums of money for the Soviet war effort. She also met socialist folk singer Woody Guthrie, who wrote a song about her. 300 Nazis died by her gun, played on a guitar marked with This Machine Kills Fascists. Rather appropriate, I think. Pavlichenko would go on to train snipers for the rest of the war, until eventually, after the victory, she completed her degree and became a historian, working in the History and Archives Department of the Soviet Navy and serving on the Committee for Soviet War Veterans. Sadly, due to the loss of her husband and severe post-traumatic stress syndrome from surviving two of the most brutal sieges in human history, she struggled with her health until passing away far too young 
at the age of 58. She remains today a hero for Ukrainians and anti-fascists around the world, and in many circles is a feminist icon. But she is but one of many in this struggle, and as it turns out, there was another Ukrainian who was held in just as high a distinction. Ivan Kozhidub, the highest scoring allied fighter ace of World War II. Ivan Kozhidub was born on the 8th of June 1920 in a village outside Shoshka, a city near Sumy in northeastern Ukraine. From a young age, he was obsessed with all things mechanical, pulling things apart and putting them back together, mostly farm machinery given rural Ukraine's agrarian nature. He proved to be a diligent student at school, and after graduating from his primary school in his hometown, he moved to Shoshka proper to continue his higher education, eventually ending up as a librarian while studying at the Shoshka Chemical Technology College. When he got there, he discovered that the local colleges had an aero club. Aviation appealed to Ivan, so he went along one day and was absolutely hooked. Training there until he graduated as a certified pilot in 1939, this, as it did for many young aviators at the time, changed his life's ambitions. If you want to fly the coolest planes, there is only one place you can do it the Air Force, and thus he enlisted in the Red Army Air Force in February of 1940, later graduating as a fully qualified military pilot in January 1941. He was trained completely on almost every single type of aircraft the Chugev Military Flying School had, as well as the current frontline fighter, the Polikarpov I-16. It was due to this high proficiency and excellent exam scores that Ivan was selected to be an instructor, rather than a line pilot and so he would be one of the men who ultimately trained the pilots of the Soviet Air Forces, who would soon be forced to face what was the finest and deadliest air force in the world at the time, the Luftwaffe. This posting as an instructor, however, while the best assignment in peacetime, is the absolute worst posting in wartime for a career fighter pilot. He wanted to shoot down fascists, but his primary role was as an instructor, and so he was forced to sit out the early phase of the war. This, in fact, probably saved his life, as the inferior early model Soviet fighters, such as the I-16, the Lag-3, and early Yak-1s, were horrifically slaughtered by the BF-109S series, and later the Focke-Wulf 190, flown by men with hundreds of hours of combat time, along with dozens of kills each. It wouldn't be until March 1943, in the lead-up to the famous Battle of Kursk, that Ivan Kozhidub would reach the front. After training on the new fighter, the LA-5, which was not only competitive, but superior to Luftwaffe aircraft at low altitude, which, thankfully for the Soviets, is where most of Eastern Front air combat took place, Ivan joined the 302nd Fighter Aviation Division and jumped into the fray. He very quickly befriended the best pilots in the squadron, wanting to learn from their experience. And in doing so, he used his extensive knowledge of flying and applied the tactics his friends had taught him to great effect. He was very soon appointed a flight commander and began shooting down German fighters with alarming regularity. In the month of October 1943, he scored 14 kills in as many days. By July of 1944, during the height of Operation Bagration, Ivan stood at 46 confirmed kills, and he was now twice honoured as a hero of the Soviet Union. But beyond that, there came something else. His unit, thanks to his efforts and those of his wingmen, had been designated as a guards unit, and due to his personal fame, his squadron was given the brand new LA-7 one of the finest piston-engined fighters ever made. The LA-7 had three 20mm cannons, an incredible top speed at low altitude, and magnificent agility. And with this new aircraft, they were granted free hunt authority. This exempted Ivan and his comrades from having to do stupid things like ground attack or escort, allowing them to do one thing, and one thing only. Fry... Fly over the front lines and find the Luftwaffe whenever and wherever they wanted, and fight them. And so his score continued to climb until one day in February 1945, 
patrolling near Frankfurt in support of the Soviet advance on Berlin, Ivan would make history for Soviet aviation. While on this patrol, he and his wingman broke off to investigate a contact skimming along the trees. It was in the process of gaining speed to climb. However, Ivan knew there was only one aircraft that needed to take such a long period to gain speed. Kozhedeb and his wingman dove in on the German Me-262 jet fighter. As the jet turned to evade, the Soviets opened fire, forcing him to steepen his turn. This forced him to slow down too much. Even blew him away with a long burst, making him the first Soviet aviator and the first Ukrainian to shoot down a jet fighter. However, it was what happened next that would set the tone for the rest of his career. Just before the war came to an end in April of 1945, Kozhedub and his unit flew deep patrols into central Germany from forward Soviet air bases, searching for the Luftwaffe. The Luftwaffe in turn, however, were busy intercepting Allied bombing raids. This led to the awkward situation of the Soviets bumping into a dogfight between Messerschmitts and Mustangs. The Americans, unaware of any friendlies in the area, nor up to date on recognition, not to mention the onset of the Cold War already creeping in, attacked the Soviet formation as they couldn't identify them and thus assumed they were weird 190 variants. Kozhidub and his wingmen broke formation and returned fire, resulting in Ivan shooting down two Mustangs. Though this event was obviously covered up, as were other friendly fire incidents, including one over Romania witnessed by the Ace of Aces Eric Hartmann, where Yaks and Mustangs opened fire on each other. By war's end, Ivan Kozhidub was standing at 64 air-to-air -air victories, the highest of any Allied fighter pilot, and one of the select few three-times hero of the Soviet Union. After the war, he went back home to continue his Air Force career, graduating with honours from the Air Force Staff College in Monino. It was then, due to being the best fighter pilot in the Soviet Union, that he was given the job of mastering and then training people on the MiG-15. To that end, he was posted to the 324th Fighter Aviation Division, soon appointed as its commander shortly afterwards. It was November 1950. There were some eager Chinese and Korean pilots who were in desperate need of instruction, but also some very young and very eager aspiring Soviet fighter pilots wanting to make their mark. During the Korean War, flying under Chinese and North Korean markings, Kozhedeb's pupils accounted for 216 South Korean, American, British and Australian aircraft for the loss of 27 MiG-15s. Though he himself was forbidden from flying, given that should he die in combat or worse be captured, it would lead to some very, very awkward questions. Though, as with Korea, Vietnam and later on during the Soviet War in Afghanistan, neither side was particularly surprised when they found suspiciously white prisoners or fatalities. After the Korean War, he had an illustrious career, testing every single new fighter aircraft flown by the Soviet Union until his retirement from flight status in 1970, including the first waves of Soviet helicopters such as the Mi-4 and the Mi-8, with almost 2,000 flight hours of combat time. He then went on to become the head of fighter combat training and tactical development in the Soviet Air Force, and later commanded the Moscow Air Military District. By 1985, he was promoted to Marshal of Aviation and the Chairman of the Federation of Aviation Sports, leading to the prominence of some of the finest aerobatics pilots to come out of Eastern Europe. After such an illustrious career, from a farm boy in rural Ukraine to one of the greatest fighter pilots in history and commander of his country's finest fighter squadrons, the ghost of Kiev is but one Ukrainian aviation legend of many. Ivan Kozhidub is the real deal and by no means alone. So I have covered the two biggest names, and if I cover all of the names in this video to the same detail, it's gonna be four hours long. So let's go through some of the lesser known Ukrainian heroes of World War II. And I'm gonna keep the aviation theme going by talking about a group of young women many of you may have heard of.
The 588th Night Bomber Regiment, or the Night Witches, are famous the world over as female pilots flying on the Eastern Front. Their name was bestowed upon them by the Germans, who received their spells with much chagrin and not a little fear. As their name suggests, they arrived during the night, and due to their light PO2 biplanes, they would approach in a glide with their engines off, silently approaching the German positions, only to then drop their bombs and restart their engines to make a speedy escape, while everyone below them panicked. As a result, often the Germans would not get any sleep. Thus, they got the name the Night Witches. What is not as well known is that many of the women from this unit were Ukrainian. In fact, almost half the women who received Hero of the Soviet Union in this unit were from Ukraine. Larissa Nikolaevna Rozanova. The head navigator of the unit was from Kiev. She served through the entire war, survived, and later became a senior engineer at the All-Russian Institute for Power Sources, all while getting married and having a family. She passed away in October of 1997. Then there is Paulina Gelman, one of Larissa's navigators. She too joined the unit in 1942 at the height of the war in the East, and served throughout the entire war, flying an incredible 857 missions and dropping 113 tons of bombs. She was a girl from the historic city of Berdyarchiv, near Zhitomir in western Ukraine. After the war, she stayed in the Air Force for a while, training and getting qualifications as a translator, learning Spanish. She would eventually become a translator, officially, and Air Force advisor in Cuba during the 1960s, where she did absolutely nothing at all. We promise, Mr. Kennedy. <clears throat> she eventually retired as a lieutenant colonel and became an economics teacher. She passed away in November of 2005. Funnily enough, though, the Night Witches were home to a lot of young women gifted with languages. Natalia Mechlin was born in Lubny and grew up in Kiev, and during her time in the Young Pioneers there, there was only one group she wanted to be with, the Glider Club. She excelled in their flying program and would later go on to graduate from Moscow Aviation Institute in 1941. Volunteering for the Air Force the moment the war began, her career with the Night Witches was marked with absolutely flawless distinction. She was the head communications officer and the nominated standard bearer of the regiment, meaning that she held the regimental flag on parade and was the first to raise the regimental guards banner when they were honoured as a guards unit. She flew 381 missions as a navigator, and then transitioned to pilot, flying for the rest of the war. By 1945, she had risen to the rank of Major and Flight Commander, flown 980 missions, dropped 147 tons of bombs, and flown in every major battle the regiment participated in. Keep in mind that Allied pilots would normally only fly 50 missions before they were rotated home on leave or on training duty. Just think about that. She later went on to Moscow State University and then the Military Institute of Foreign Languages alongside her colleague Polina, where she worked as a translator in Moscow until her retirement from the Air Force. She spent the rest of her life as a writer, co-authoring a book on the Night Witches with her comrade Irina Rakoboskaya, a Russian woman who went on to become an award-winning astrophysicist. Man, the witches really were something. She kept writing and lived out her days peacefully. Natalia passed away in June of 2005. Sadly, though, not all of the Ukrainian witches made it through the war. Yevdokya Nosal was a schoolteacher in Mykolaiv and a lover of aviation. She had learned to fly at the Kherson Aero Club and had graduated to being a flight instructor before the war began. When the Germans invaded, her partner had immediately gone to the front. She, meanwhile, had just given birth to her son and was organising their evacuation to the east. As she was doing this, the Germans bombed Mikolaev, which included a direct hit on the maternity ward of the hospital. Her newborn son was among the children killed there. Rage does not begin to describe what she felt. Immediately joining the Red Air Force in October of 1941, she was known in the squadron for being their most dedicated member, rising to Deputy Squadron Commander in mere months. 
She flew more missions than anyone else, and whenever the squadron was tasked with hitting a particularly dangerous target, like an airbase or a headquarters, she always volunteered to lead it, without exception. She had one purpose in her life now. The invaders had killed her baby, and she was now on a mission to kill Adolf personally, with her bare hands if she could. In less than one year, she flew 354 missions and dropped 48 tons of bombs in less than a year, sometimes flying five times a night, changing planes and filling in for the other pilots who needed a rest. She, however, never took one herself. She was killed on the 22nd of April, 1943, by a shrapnel wound to the temple, instantly taking her life. She was subsequently awarded Hero of the Soviet Union. And so we move to the last witch on this list, which we will discuss today. Yevgena Rudineva. She was a Berdyansk girl, daughter of the local telegrapher and telephone operator. She had always dreamed of the stars. She studied at Moscow State University and became the head of the Solar Studies Department in the Association of Soviet Astronomers. Naturally, when the war came, someone with this knowledge of the stars was born to be a night bomber navigator, and she was trained as such. She flew 645 combat missions over the front, flying backseat for some of the women I've already mentioned, as well as for the regimental commander. Writing to the Dean of the University of Moscow, she swore that the first bomb she dropped would be a reply to the Nazis' air raids on Moscow, which had hit the university's mathematics and engineering department, killing several of her comrades. She stated that she was upholding the university's honour in the field, along with her classmates. She would keep that pledge, giving her life in the cause of freedom on April 9th, 1944, along with thousands of her countrymen. And that leads into the last chapter. The last chapter of this video is what I have titled, The Unsung Heroes. There are always famous heroes in wars, and the two big ones from Ukraine we have already covered. But there are often ones that you never really hear of, ones that do incredible deeds, and the ones mentioned here have all been awarded the highest order of gallantry, and yet, no one knows their name. Well, I shall rectify that in a small way. Starting with one which to this day I still remember clearly, even though she is just but a footnote in the history of one of humanity's biggest battles. Her story has always stuck with me. Nina Onilova. She was an orphan, growing up in Odessa in an orphanage, and had a really, really rough life. Both her parents had died, and so, as soon as she was of working age, she began working in a textile mill. Nevertheless, she was very patriotic and a cheerful girl, and she'd always been a part of the community, and so had joined the Communist Youth League, or the Komsomol. During one of their movie nights, they had watched the film Chapayev, about the famous Russian general Chapayev during the Civil War. In that film, during one of the big battles, a heroic Bolshevik unit is pinned down by the evil advancing Tsarists, only to be saved by a brave woman machine gunner named Anka. Nina was inspired, and joined her factory's militia unit, as most trade unions and factories in the Soviet Union had a workers' brigade, kind of like the PAL battalions from Britain in World War I. And Nina made it clear that she wanted to be a machine gunner, which she duly became. And so, when the Germans invaded, she immediately went to the recruiting office, only to be told, tell me if you've heard this story before, that she was going to be assigned as a medic with all the other women, just as they had tried to do with Pavlichenko. Though, unfortunately for Nina, she didn't have the official Red Army qualification like Lyudmila did, and so a medic she became, but not for long. Serving actually in the same unit as Pavlichenko, just in the medic division instead of the sniper division, during the siege of Odessa, Nina was performing first aid on a wounded soldier and their ammo bearer. These guys were part of a Maxim machine gun crew. 
While performing first aid, the Germans were launching an attack on the position, and as the attack was underway, the machine gun jammed. Realizing the break in the fire, the Germans used this moment to charge the position. Nina, noticing that the fire had stopped, immediately dropped what she was doing and turned around. She saw that the gunner was struggling to clear the jam. He couldn't do it. So, she pushed the guy out the way, serviced the weapon, cleared the jam, racked the bolt, and then gunned down the entire German squad pushing their position before they could get into grenade range. Nina then casually turned around and finished treating the guys that she was attending to. As of that moment, her commanding officer transferred Nina to the machine gun section. This, she would faithfully serve and execute her duty. Later, during the same siege of Odessa, she was badly wounded. However, she chose to stay with her unit instead of being evacuated, and thus followed them to the Battle of Crimea, where she again partook in their actions. She had trouble walking, she was seriously wounded, but instead of being transferred to a field hospital, she again chose to remain with her unit, fighting where she could and treating wounded or packing ammo when she couldn't. But again, the fighting spirit of this woman could not be stopped. During the siege of Sevastopol, her squad was defending a village against Manstein's tank divisions pushing on the city. One of the panzers had her unit pinned down, so Nina, despite still being wounded, despite her squad being pinned down and against the protest of her comrades, grabbed two Molotov cocktails and crawled across 25 yards of open ground right in front of the Germans and tossed them into the tank's engine bay, burning out the tank and saving her unit. She was promoted on the spot and awarded the Order of the Red Banner. Ultimately, though, she too would give her life for her homeland. As 1942 began, the German ring around Sevastopol was starting to close, and Nina's unit was barely hanging on. German pioneer units were slowly eroding the defensive line, combined with heavy artillery. During a concerted effort by a pioneer battalion to seize a village on the road to the city itself, Nina and her machine gun team were the first line of defense. After several hours of fighting, Nina was found by the reinforcements coming up from the reserve. She was seriously wounded, with heavy internal bleeding. What they found alongside her, though, is what earned her the title Hero of the Soviet Union. Her comrades, her entire unit, were dead around her. She was the only survivor, mortally wounded and clinging onto the gun. Yet in front of her position was roughly two platoons to an entire company of dead Germans. She had held the position alone for several hours before reinforcements came. She died of her wounds after being evacuated to a field hospital on March 8th, 1942. Her story is not known. I don't see it anywhere. You have to go digging for this story, yet it's such a powerful one. And there are no shortage. There are so many lesser-known heroes, such as Mikhail Petrovich Sivzeski, a naval aviator with the Black Sea Fleet who flew 396 missions, sank 60,000 tons of Axis shipping, shot down three German aircraft, and destroyed at least 31 tanks. He ended the war a major and demobilized by working on Ukrainian collective farms to rebuild his country. He later became the foreman of a mechanical goods and rubber factory in Kiev, where he worked until his retirement. He passed away in November of 1989. And speaking of the Navy, we have one of the Soviet Union's most celebrated submarine commanders, Vladimir Konavalov. A boy from the Donbass who studied in Donetsk, he later graduated from the Frunze Naval School and served in the Black Sea Fleet before being transferred to submarine L-3 in the Baltic. He served as the first officer and later captain of L3 throughout World War II, engaged in mine laying and attacking German supply ships, moving iron ore from Sweden to Germany, and later attacking ships evacuating troops from Kurland and East Prussia in 1945. He was later promoted to rear admiral and served as the commander of submarines Baltic Fleet, but passed away from a stroke a year after his appointment in November 1967. He remained a prominent figure in the Soviet submarine community, and in the novel Hunt for Red October, the Soviet submarine which is intercepting USS Dallas and Red October is named 
the Soviet ship VK Kanavalov. But the last story, the story I'll end on today, is the story of a young man. A man who gave his life for his home. In fact, he gave it for his local community. Though he was not a man, but a boy. The youngest ever recipient of Hero of the Soviet Union. Not much is known about him, as he never got to tell his story. Valentin Koitek was born in a village near the city of Shepetovka, in western Ukraine, just south of the Pripyat Marsh. Valentin was a bright kid, and an active member of the Young Pioneers. When the Germans invaded in 1941, he was just 11 years old. Most kids would still be in school or working in their local family business, but not Valentin. After Shepetovka was occupied by the invaders, he joined the local partisans and began work, stealing ammunition and weapons from local caches that he could sneak into, being so small. He also put up propaganda in the alleys and streets of his hometown, and conducting reconnaissance was easy for him as a young kid wouldn't arouse suspicion. He was just playing or curious about the soldiers, while surreptitiously counting how many Germans there were, where they were, and what they were armed with. In 1943, when he was 13, the adults in the partisan movement finally allowed him to go on actual missions, which he did with great aplomb. Using his small build and his speed as a scout, he would scope out German positions and relay their locations. One mission, he discovered the German field headquarters by discovering where they'd run their telephone cable. So, the enterprising teenager cut the phone lines, cutting off their communications, and then relayed the position of the headquarters, which was then subsequently attacked and overrun by the partisans, who then blew it up. He himself, actually, also had a knack for blowing things up. Railway lines, specifically. What solidified his status as a hero, though, is when he saved his entire partisan unit from destruction. While pulling guard one night, he had picked up on signs that someone was approaching their hideout. Signs that only a kid who'd known the area for a long time would notice. So, Valentin went to investigate. In doing so, he located a German anti-partisan patrol, getting ready to lay an ambush for them. He responded to this situation by shooting the officer in command of the German patrol dead, and then retreated to raise the alarm through a hail of gunfire. With the enemy officer dead, the Germans fell back in confusion as the partisans made their escape. Sadly, as I mentioned at the start of this bit, though, his luck would run out. During the liberation of Ukraine in February 1944, the partisan movements launched a general offensive throughout the Soviet Union in support of the Red Army's upcoming operations that would happen once the Spring Thaw ended. It was during a battle for his neighbouring town that Valentin Koitek fell in a firefight with occupying forces, several days after his 14th birthday. But he didn't fall for nothing. None of them did. They did it so we can live in a better world today. And while someone claiming their legacy is trampling on their sacrifice, I would say that we should remember this photo here. This is a Ukrainian, a Kazakh, and a Russian, standing on top of the ruins of a fascist oligarchy. The guy on the right of frame is a man I mentioned at the start of the video. He was born in Kazakhstan, and fought with the Red Army until the Battle of Berlin. After the war, he made Ukraine his home, becoming a firefighter in Kiev. He retired from that role as a lieutenant colonel of the fire service, and one of the senior fire chiefs of Kiev. He was adopted and loved by the community. His name was Alexei Kovalev. Well, the man who took this photo was a Ukrainian war reporter. And he, of course, took the most famous photo of the Eastern Front. Yevgeny Kalde worked for TASS News Service and later Pravda, but he was still known for this iconic photograph, and it is still seen today. The heroism and the sacrifices of the individuals in this video live on in their memory. But more importantly... They stand for the millions of heroes who all join together to stop the forces of darkness. 
And now the time to take that stand is coming again. I'm just an amateur historian come journalist. Too far away and too unfit to contribute directly. But by doing what I do here, I do what I can. And it's time for all of us to do the same. We must all do what we can. And so, I will once again leave you with the words of President Zelensky, as he is more entitled to talk to you than me. But as always, Slava Ukraine, and happy Victory Day. Чи може стати чорно-білою весна? Чи буває вічний лютий? Чи знецінюються золоті слова? На жаль, Україна знає відповіді на всі ці запитання. На жаль, ці відповіді так. Щороку, 8 травня, разом з усім цивілізованим світом ми вшановуємо кожного, хто захищав планету від нацизму у руки Другої світової війни. Мільйони втрачених життів, скалічених доль, закатованих душ і мільйони причин, щоб сказати злу ніколи знову. Ми знали ціну, яку сплатили за цю мудрість наші предки. Знали, як важливо вберегти її та передати нащадкам. Але і гадки не мали, що наше покоління буде свідком на руги над словами, що, як виявилось, є істиною далеко не для всіх. Цьогоріч ми кажемо ніколи знову інакше. Ми чуємо ніколи знову інакше. Це звучить болісно. Жорстоко, без оклику, а зі знаком питання. Ви кажете ніколи знову? Розкажіть про це Україні. 24 лютого слово ніколи стерли. Розстріляли і розбомбили сотнями ракет о четвертій ранку, якими розбудили всю Україну. Ми почули моторошні вибухи. Ми почули знову. Місто Бородянка – одна із багатьох жертв цього злочину. Позаду мене – один із багатьох свідків. Не військовий об'єкт, не секретна база, а проста дев'ятиповерхівка. Чи може вона нести безпекову загрозу для РФ, для однієї восьмої частини суші, другої армії світу, ядерної держави? Чи може бути щось? Більш безглуздим, ніж це запитання. Може. 250-кілограмові фугасні бомби, якими сверхдержава засипала це маленьке містечко. І воно оніміло. Воно не може сьогодні сказати ніколи знову. Воно не може сьогодні нічого сказати. Але тут, тут усе зрозуміло без слів. Просто погляньте на цей будинок. Колись... Тут були стіни, колись на них були фото, а на фото були ті, ті, хто колись пройшов пекло війни. Пів сотні чоловіків, яких відправили в Німеччину на примусові роботи. Ті, хто згорів заживо, коли нацисти спалили тут понад 100 хатин. 250 бійців, які загинули на фронтах Другої світової війни та загалом майже Тисяча жителів Бородянки, які боролись і перемогли нацизм. Щоб ніколи знову бились за майбутнє дітей, за життя, яке було тут до 24 лютого. Уявіть, як в кожній з цих квартир люди лягали спати. Бажають один одному на добраніч, вимикають світло, обіймають коханих. Заплющують очі, мріють про щось. Настає повна тиша. Вони всі засинають, не знаючи, що не всі прокинуться. Вони міцно сплять. Їм сниться щось приємне. Та через кілька годин їх розбудять. Розбудять вибухи ракет, а хтось не прокинеться більше ніколи. Ніколи знову. З цього гасла виконали слово «ніколи». 
ампутували під час так званої спецоперації. Встромили ніж у серце і, дивлячись в очі, сказали «Ета не ми». Закатували зі словами «Не все так однозначно». Вбили ніколи, знову сказавши «Можем повторити». Так і сталося. І потвори почали повтори. І наші міста, які пережили страшну окупацію настільки, що 80 років мало, що про неї забути, знов побачили окупанта. І отримали другу дату окупації у своїй історії. А деякі, як, наприклад, Маріуполь, третю. Третю. За два роки окупації нацисти вбили в ньому 10 тисяч мирних людей. За два місяці окупації РФ вбила 20 тисяч. Через десятиліття після Другої світової темрява повернулася в Україну, і вона знову стала чорно-білою. Знову. Зло повернулося. Знову. В іншій формі, під іншими гаслами, але з тією ж метою в Україні влаштували криваву реконструкцію нацизму. Фанатичне наслідування цьому режиму, його ідеям, діям, словам і символам. Маніакальне до деталей. Відтворення його звірств та алібі, що начебто надають злу священну мету. Повторення його злочинів. І навіть спроби. Спроби перевершити вчителя та посунути його з п'єдесталу найбільшого зла в історії людства. Встановити новий світовий рекорд з ксенофобії, ненависті, расизму і числа жертв, до якого вони можуть призвести. Ніколи знову це була ода людини розумної, гін цивілізованого світу, але хтось сфальшивив, спотворив ніколи знову нотами сумніву, заглушив розпочавши свою смертельну арію зла. І це зрозуміло всім країнам, які побачили жахи нацизму на власні очі. А сьогодні відчувають моторошне дежавю. Бачать знову всі народи, яких клеймили третім сортом, рабами, без права на власну державу, чи взагалі на існування, чують заяви, які які підносять одну націю, а інші з легкістю викреслюють. Кажуть, що вас насправді не існує, ви штучно створені, а отже безправні. Всі чують мову зла. Знову. І разом визнають болючу правду. Ми не протримались навіть століття. Нашого «never again» вистачило на 77 років. Ми прогавили зло. Воно Відродилась знову і зараз. Again and now. Це розуміють всі країни і всі народи, які сьогодні підтримують Україну. І попри нову маску звіра, впізнали його. Бо на відміну від декого пам'ятають, за що і проти чого боролись наші предки. Не переплутали перше з другим, не поміняли їх місцями, не забули, не забули поляки на землі яких нацисти почали свій марш і зробили перший постріл Другої світової війни. Не забули, як спочатку зло тебе звинувачує, провокує, називає агресором, а потім нападає. О 4.45. І каже, що це самозахист. І вони бачили, як це повторилось на нашій землі. Вони пам'ятають зруйновані нацистами Варшаву. І бачать, що зробили з Маріуполем. Не забули британці, як нацисти стирали з лиця землі Ковентрі, який бомбили 41 раз. Як звучала місячна соната від Люфтвафи, коли по місту без перерв гатили 11 годин. Як зруйнували його історичний центр, фабрики, собор Святого Михаїла. І вони бачили, як ракетами били по Харкову як спотворили його історичний центр, заводи і Свято-Успенський собор. Вони пам'ятають, як Лондон бомбили 57 ночей поспіль, як ФАУ падали на Белфаст, Портсмут, Ліверпуль. І бачать, як прилітають крилаті ракети в Миколаїв, Краматорськ, Чернігів. Пам'ятають, як гатили по Бірмінгем. І бачать, 
як дістається його місту по братиму Запоріжжя. Це пам'ятають нідерландці, як Роттердам став першим містом, що зазнала тотального знищення, коли нацисти скинули на нього 97 тонн бомб. Це пам'ятають французи, пам'ятають Орадур Сюрглан, де есесівці спалили заживо півтисячі жінок і дітей. Масові повішення в тюлі, різанина в селищі Аск, багатотисячна акція спротиву в окупованому Лілі. Вони бачили, що зробили в Бучі, Ірпені, Бородянці, Волновасі, Тросянці. Вони бачать, як окупували Херсон, Мелітопи, Бердянськ та інші наші міста, в яких люди не здаються. І виходять багатотисячні мирні акції, які не під силу окупанту, і все, що вони можуть, лише стріляти по мирним людям. Це не забули і чехи, як за менше, ніж за добу, нацисти знищили лідиці, залишивши від селища суцільне попелище. Вони бачили, як знищили попасну. Від неї не лишилось навіть попелище. Не забули греки, які пережили масові вбивства і розстріли на всій території, блокаду і великий голод. Про це пам'ятають американці, які били зі злом на два фронти, які пройшли Перл-Харбор і Дюнкерк разом із союзниками. І всі ми разом проходимо нові, не менш складні битви. Це пам'ятають всі, хто пережив Голокост. Як один народ може сильно ненавидіти інших. Це не забули литовці, латвійці, естонці, данці, грузини, вірмени, бельгійці, норвежці та ще багато. Багато інших, всіх, хто постраждав від нацизму на своїй землі. І всі, хто переміг його у складі антигітлеровської коаліції. На жаль, є ті, хто переживши всі ці злочини, втративши мільйони людей, які боролися за перемогу і здобули її, сьогодні осквернив пам'ять про них та їхній подвиг. Той, хто дозволив обстрілювати зі своєї землі міста України, які поруч з нашими предками звільняли і його предки. Той, хто плюнув у обличчя своєму безсмертному полку, поставивши поруч з ним катів із Буч і кинув виклик всьому людству, але забув про головне. Будь-яке зло завжди закінчується однаково. Воно закінчується. Дорогі українці, сьогодні у День пам'яті та примирення ми вклоняємось перед усіма, хто захищав рідну землю і світ від нацизму. Ми відзначаємо подвиг українського народу та його внесок у перемогу антигітлеровської коаліції. Вибухи, постріли, окопи, поранення, голод, бомбардування, блокади, масові розстріли, каральні операції, окупації, концтабори, газові камери, жовті зірки, гетто, бабин яр, хатинь. Полон, примусові роботи, вони загинули за те, щоб кожен із нас знав, що означають ці поняття з книжок, а не з власного досвіду. Але сталося інакше. Це несправедливо перед ними усіма. Але правда переможе, і ми все подолаємо. І доказ цьому має назву «Вервольф». Це колишня ставка і бункер Гітлера біля Вінниці. І все, що від неї Залишилось декілька каменів, руїни, розвалини, розвалини того, хто вважав себе величним і непереможним. Це дороговказ усім нам і майбутнім поколінням, те, за що боролись наші предки і довели. Жодне зло не уникне відповідальності, не зможе сховатись в бункері, від нього не лишиться каменя, на камені. Тож ми все подолаємо, і ми знаємо це точно, бо наші військові і всі наші люди – нащадки тих, хто подолав нацизм. Тож переможуть знову. І знову буде мир, нарешті знову. Ми подолаємо зиму, яка почалась 24 лютого, триває 8 травня, але точно скінчиться і її розтопить українське сонце. 
І ми зустрінемо наш світанок усією країною. І рідні, та кохані, друзі та близькі будуть поруч знову. Нарешті знову. І над тимчасово окупованими містами і селами наш прапор замайорить знову. Нарешті знову. І ми зберемось разом, і буде мир нарешті знову. І більше ніяких чорно-білих снів, а тільки синьо-жовта мрія. Нарешті знову. За це боролись наші предки. Вічна шана всім, хто протистояв нацизму. Вічна пам'ять всім загиблим під час Другої світової війни.